thanks for coming along today as the Sydney Institute continues its series of uh, meetings at a time of um, pandemic. And today's speaker is Tanya Plebisek on the occasion of the launch of the book which she has edited, Upturn a Better Normal After COVID-19. Now, Tanya Plebisek, I guess, is one of the best known Australians, so I'll introduce her, introduce her very briefly as... Um, Federal Shadow Minister for Education and Training. She served as Deputy Leader of the Australian Labor Party and Deputy Leader of the Opposition from 2013 to 2019. And she's been the member for Sydney since 1998. And of course, Tanya Plebisek was a Senior Cabinet Minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments. And on the occasion of the launch of this book, uh, Tanya Plebisek making a welcome return to the Sydney Institute is going to talk on the topic of after COVID-19, uh, upturn a new norm, a better normal. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much, Jared, for that introduction. And I want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's very good of you, um, Anne and Jared, to give me this opportunity to speak to the Sydney Institute once again. I always enjoy these uh, opportunities to come together for a bit of debate, sometimes a bit of disagreement. I think being able to debate and dis disagree in a democracy like Australia is so very important. We need more of it. A year ago, people would have told you that it was impossible for school children to shift overnight to online learning, impossible for banks to offer mortgage holidays, impossible for us to house rough sleepers or put a hold on evictions, impossible to provide wage subsidies or double the unemployment benefit, and absolutely impossible to get Australians to stay home from the pub or the beach. Many things we assumed about ourselves, many things we assumed about the world have been proven wrong. The coronavirus has tested us as Australians, and for the most part, we have risen to the challenge. Overwhelmingly, Australians have shown themselves to be disciplined and kind. We listened to experts. We followed advice. We put our lives on hold for the health of others. For every act of selfishness, there were 10 acts of love and community spirit of patriotism and solidarity at their practical best. Sometimes we can fixate on our problems as a country, on the things that we do wrong, but we shouldn't be embarrassed to celebrate our successes, to acknowledge the things that we've done well as a people. Of course, Australia isn't out of danger yet, as today's figures from South Australia show us. We can't afford to become slack or complacent, as the scenes in Europe and America make very clear. But we do have a responsibility to begin to think about the kind of society and the kind of economy that we want to rebuild after this virus. Wars, recessions, depressions, pandemics, all are devastating all change society fundamentally. This country will face massive questions in coming years, as big as those we faced coming out of World War II. Because Australians have sacrificed a lot this year. Some, too many, have lost family members. Many couldn't be with those family members in their final days and could, in some cases couldn't even attend funerals. Hundreds of thousands have lost their job or lost their business. Millions have experienced periods of isolation and loneliness. These sacrifices in many cases were necessary, but they were painful. They should mean something. They should produce something lasting and good. Australians have earned a better deal, not a return to insecurity and growing inequality. We know what the Conservative plan for recovery will look like over the next few years. Wage cuts for Australian workers. We know this because the plan hasn't changed since Tony Abbott's budget of 2014 
or since the Liberals cut penalty rates in 2017, falling wages are a recipe for a slower, more painful recovery and a much less equal country on the other side. We're already seeing this in our economy. As the Treasurer admitted last week in Parliament, the unemployment rate has again ticked up. He said it had ticked up immediately following cuts to JobKeeper, JobSeeker and the other financial supports. We must not accept years of lingering unemployment and underemployment. We need to be much more ambitious than that. And that ambition needs to start at the top. The federal government should set an official target of full employment and it should use every tool at its disposal to achieve that goal. First things first, the government needs to change its attitude to wages. If low wages continue to be, and I quote, a deliberate design feature of our economic architecture, as Matthias Cormann said, this recession will drag on. Economic recovery requires a thriving private sector, which requires a customer base that can afford their products. Low wages mean less aggregate demand in our economy, which means less buying and selling, which means less recruiting and hiring. It means people don't have an extra five bucks in their pocket to buy a cup of coffee on the way to work. It means that people don't feel confident to take the kids out for pizza on a Friday night. Even the Reserve Bank is now acknowledging that stagnant wages are holding our economy back and stopping us from reaching the Reserve Bank's 2-3% inflation target. The Federal Government also needs to think about how it can directly support employment around the country. Wherever you look, wherever you live, there's infrastructure that needs to be built or repaired. There are projects that would make our cities, our towns, our country more efficient and more livable. They don't have to be enormous in scale either. In every community across Australia, there is a school or a TAFE or a hospital that could do with being upgraded. There are footpaths that need fixing. There are community halls that need work, public toilets that need a lot of work. It's not glamorous, but it can create jobs everywhere and anywhere. We also shouldn't be afraid of stronger employment in the public sector. One very obvious example is aged care. We need thousands more people looking after the more than 100,000 people we have currently on a waiting list for home care. So there's more than 100,000 people who've been uh, assessed as eligible for home care. Uh, we know that they need the help. We've got millions of people who are unemployed or underemployed. What we need is government willpower to make sure that those jobs are there caring for people in their homes. This is true across the caring professions where work clearly needs to be done and we have unemployed people available to do it. The only thing missing is a government commitment to training the workforce and funding aged care, early childhood education and care, disability services and those other caring professions. People who work in these fields should be well trained with permanent work that's properly paid. These are honourable professions and we should start treating them that way. As we've tragically learnt this year, an insecure workforce leads to poorer services. It's bad for us all. There's a lesson there for us in the recovery. It's up to government to make sure that people have the work security they need to thrive. Good pay, good conditions, a reliable safety net. These aren't the end result of growth and prosperity. They are a precondition for it. I'm thinking about my own childhood here. My dad was a plumber and gas fitter. He was the plumbing leading hand. He worked at the jet base at Qantas at Mascot. And 
remember um, every Friday he would come home with his pay packet in a white envelope, the cash and coins counted out um, in that envelope each week. And it never worried me that it was not a particularly fat pay packet. Uh, if I'd thought about it in these terms as a kid, the thing that meant something was the sense of certainty that every Friday he'd be coming home with his pay packet every Friday. And I really, um, I, I think that sense of safety and confidence is something that is so profoundly missing in today's economy and society. That money was always going to be there, in my view, as a kid. I think all Australians deserve that confidence. Uh, their kids deserve that confidence. Insecurity at work is a choice this government has made, and we can choose to fight against it, to reverse it. There's no reason that miners who are working for profitable global companies should be forced onto contracts to work for less because their boss wants to bring in the uh, labour hire company otherwise. There's no reason that aged care workers can't be working one good full-time job instead of trying to make up a full-time income by working across two or three different nursing homes. There is no reason why the gig economy should mean job insecurity or low wages. John Howard used to talk about wanting Australians to be relaxed and comfortable. And I actually really think there is something in that. Most of us yearn for a time when we weren't looking suspiciously at every door handle or wondering how we were going to afford the rent next month. We all deserve a bit of relaxation after 2020, the year that we've had. But I think we should aim for something a little higher than relaxed and comfortable because it's too complacent for a country like ours that has led the world in so many ways. We should instead be aiming for relaxed and confident. We want people to be confident enough to spend and invest, knowing that they'll have a job next week and next year. Australians should be confident that if they work hard, their job is safe and secure. They should be confident that their kids will have a better quality of life than they've had, that their dreams and education won't be weighed down by a lifetime of debt. We should all be confident that our beautiful bush and reef will be there for future generations. We should be confident that we can withstand the next shock and if we fall on hard times, be helped back onto our feet. This year has taught us so much about ourselves. Above all, it's reminded us that we can achieve truly remarkable things, things we once considered impossible. It's within our power to build the country that we all want to live in and to leave to our kids. An Australia that builds things, an Australia that makes things, an Australia that cares for its people, an Australia with secure jobs, with good wages. It's within our reach. We just need to grab it. Thank you. Well, many thanks to Tanya Plebisek. And uh, as I said at the, at the beginning, uh, this is the occasion of the launch of the editor collection by Tanya Plebisek titled Upturn, A Better Normal After COVID-19. And um, Tanya Plebisek will be sell signing some books today and will be selling them online um, very soon. So. And now we come to questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, Tony Plepisek, thanks for uh, your speech and congratulations on the book. So tell me, uh, when did you decide to do it and why did you decide to do it? Well, I decided to do the book, I think it was probably around April, Jared, because, well, two reasons, really. I, I had started to turn my mind to how, how deep the recession was likely to be if the health effects were as catastrophic as we'd seen in other parts of the world. And for, for myself, I wanted to think about how we could rebuild the economy after the health crisis had been managed. And so I started ringing some of these people and saying, what do you think? How are things looking? 
um, some of them are health experts, economists, scientists and others, just to say how are we managing now, how do we rebuild afterwards. And I thought it, it's one of the greatest privileges of my job that I can ring someone like Ross Garno and say, Ross, can you talk to me about the economy? Or Stephen Kukoulos. It, it seems selfish just to do that for one person. I thought actually taking what they were saying about their predictions and being able to share that with others was a, a good project for um, lockdown. Also, I was kind of bored on Saturday nights because I wasn't allowed out. So I thought, well, why not write a book? So if there's another pandemic, there'll be another book? I'm hoping there will not be another pandemic in my lifetime, although the scientific predictions are that there may well be. We may be getting them more often than not. So as you know, we're heading towards the end of the year, so I've got to ask the question, I mean, is this the sign of a leadership challenge? <laughs> no, no, no. It's a sign of someone who um, likes talking to people uh, and thinking about, uh, thinking about how we can do better. So what does your leader, Anthony Albanese, say about it? Uh, I, I, hey, I don't think he's read it yet. He's uh, just launched mm. Andrew Lee's book, so it's going to have to go on his oh, reading list over Christmas. Yeah. I forgot about Andrew Lee's book, so there's a rival book. Well, a Andrew Lee's book actually is very good. It's about, it's called um, Reconnected, and it's about uh, how community building organisations can work better to mm. strengthen society. It's an excellent book too. So the second... Um, question is, I mean, if this book was being reviewed by Joel Fitzgibbon in the Newcastle Herald, uh, what do you think he'd say about it? It's too long. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, beyond that, he um, uh, doesn't say much about coal workers. And, uh, well, I, I, think it, I think it does, um, not coal workers in particular, but there's two things uh, about, there's two things that are happening in the economy that I can't... Um, that I can't ignore, I don't think we should ignore. The first is this nonsense that you can either address climate change or be worried about working class, blue collar jobs, but you can't do both. That's just rubbish. We, uh, we are globally experiencing um, an, ec an economic transformation driven by cheaper, cleaner energy. And we know that solar and wind power are now cheaper uh, than coal-fired electricity. That is just a fact. And we need to take the benefit of that and use it to create jobs. Australia has enormous manufacturing capacity. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the things that most puts at risk jobs in blue-collar sectors like that is the high cost of electricity in Australia. Um, Ross Garno has an excellent chapter in here that talks about the kind of industries that we could have a natural advantage in in Australia if we made the most of our uh, opportunities uh, for cheaper, cleaner energy. Really the big job killer in blue collar industries is the uncertainty that this government has introduced into energy policy. They've had 22 different energy policies. We've got high gas prices, we've got high electricity prices, they've been in government for seven years. It's no good flapping about uh, if you're a Liberal or a National Party member and saying someone ought to do something. They've had the opportunity to do something and their insecurity, the, um, the, the lack of predictability in energy policy has meant that things have got worse, not better. We've now got more pollution and higher prices. You've got a couple of journalists in this book, Annabel Crabbe and... Lenore Taylor. As I recall, Annabel Crabb, I think she got the presidential election right, but she got the last federal election wrong. Now, if you look at the last federal election, as you well know, Labor was favoured to win by many journalists, not all, but many, and you didn't win primarily because you didn't do well in northern Tasmania, you lost a seat in western Sydney, you didn't do well in central and northern Queensland as well as you expected. Um, and Joel Fitzgibbon narrowly hang on, hung on to his seat in, in uh, New South Wales around the Hunter region, but, but only narrowly. So what's in this book that will encourage people who didn't vote for you in northern Tasmania, western Sydney, around the Hunter region, or in uh, central and northern Queensland? What would, here would encourage them to vote for Labor next time? 
I think there's a very strong focus in the book on jobs and uh, it's always the most important thing that we need to think through and work through if we're seeking to form government. Where are the jobs coming from? What kind of work are people going to be doing? What are the pay and conditions attached to those jobs? And in the book we've got Sally McManus talking about job security uh, and wages. We've got um, Ross Garno and others talking about the kind of economy, Stephen Kukoulos, the kind of economy we want to see. But um, Jenny Macklin is writing about full employment. Uh, Wayne Swan is talking about um, strong jobs growth uh, and how it relates to the macro economy. It, it, it's a cliche. It's a cliche, Jared, but it's jobs, jobs, jobs. And a big part of the book is focused on that. In your speech today, which is um, similar to the introduction that you wrote, mm -hmm. and then you've also got your own chapter, which we'll come to later. So in your speech today and in the introduction, the emphasis seems to be on what governments can do to create jobs, that governments sh should be doing this and governments should be doing that, and it's unfair to ask you to cost it now because we don't exactly know where all the current pandemic crisis is going to end up, and we're probably one and a half years away fr from an election. But so. That's not a criticism, but there wasn't much focus, and there's not much focus in the book on small business, which, as we know, is probably suffering most from the pandemic. If you look around places like Sydney, more so in Melbourne, where so many small businesses, particularly in the tertiary industries, in entertainment and um, and catering and whatever else, whatever else, are closing, probably never to reopen. So, what's in this book for people who are running a, a medium to small business? I think um, having a look at Heather Riddart's chapter and Annie O'Rourke's chapter would be of the greatest interest to people who are uh, running a small business or interested in small business. Um, Heather Riddart looks at the sort of tax and other policy settings that you need to have a, an effectively operating private sector. Um, Fiona Simpson, of course, uh, who's the uh, National Farmers Federation, writes about um, you know, some of the most important small businesses uh, or sometimes medium businesses in our country, the family farms. Uh, Gabby Chan also writes about the family farm. And there's a really good chapter by Annie O'Rourke who's talking about a, a huge change that's happened in recent years with um, predominantly women running their own small businesses from regional communities. So Annie's gone from a very successful political career in Canberra as a staffer to running um, a media communications uh, consultancy from Byron Bay. She's, she's made the dream lifestyle change that so many people talk about and never do. She writes very convincingly about what businesses like hers need to thrive in today's economy. And I think it's... Um, it's good to have these different economic perspectives because we've got uh, Cameron Klein in here writing about banking, we've got uh, Greg Combe writing about superannuation, so some of our largest businesses writing about the sort of economic settings that we need for those businesses to be successful, but also what those large businesses need to do to support success in the rest of the economy. And on the other hand, we've got some of these very small, even micro business owners talking about you know, what they need, what they need for their businesses to continue to thrive. So from government, what would you be doing for them? Well, I think one of the most important things we can do is invest in having an educated and skilled workforce. We know that investment from early childhood through schools, TAFE and university are really critical to our success as a, uh, as a nation. Ian Chubb writes about science um, and research and development more generally in the critical uh, role for government in supporting really good research and development and commercialisation. Um, but of course it's also about the, um, the, the big thing government can do is underpin confidence in our economy. We're not going to have people confident to spend, businesses confident to invest unless we've got strong aggregate demand in our economy. Uh, and I think it's arguable that the supports that the government introduced, like JobKeeper, the wages subsidy have been really critical to minimising the economic impact of the COVID-19 recession, but the premature withdrawal or, or reduction of some of those supports uh, can mean that our economy will be in recession 
for longer and the recession will be deeper than it needs to be. So going back to the Joel Fitzgibbon point, if you're, if you're a coal miner living in Singleton and um, your friend runs a very a small shop selling clothing and another friend is in restaurants, small restaurants, what do they get out of this? Because um, it didn't work in the last election for Labor, so why would it be better in, let's say, May 2022? Yes, you, you, you keep, you keep um, reminding me of the wound that I'm just healing from, Jared, with the last election. Oh, it's 18 months ago. Uh, oh, yes, just get over it. Um, <laughs> look, I think the important things in the book, if you're looking at, let's talk about the coal miner in Singleton. What does the coal miner in Singleton need? Coal and gas are going to be part of our energy mix for many years to come. There's no question about that. But as new energy enters into our national energy market, it's going to be cheaper if it's solar or wind power. That is just an economic fact. Uh, and we need to work out how to get the best use of, out of that um, renewable energy to support jobs in other industries. As for the coal miner, who will have a job for many years to come, because coal and gas are part of our energy mix for the foreseeable future, what about the pain conditions of that person? We've got a government that pretends to be on the side of coal miners when they've done everything they can to make it easier to replace that coal miner with someone from a labour hire company doing the same job for less pay. We've got a government that's done everything it can in other industries to reduce penalty rates, to reduce job security. That's not a recipe for that coal miner to have the confidence to go and spend some of his or her pay packet in the neighbour's shops or in the pizza place on a Friday night uh, or in the supermarket on the way home from work. Confidence is about saying, yes, the mining sector in Australia is important, and not just coal mining, I would say. Don't forget, we've got some of the best deposits of rare earths, um, minerals, uh, the, the, uh, um, the things that we need to produce solar batteries uh, and you know, complex, uh, um, complex uh, uh, inputs into some of the more, um, you know, the technologies that we're making use of every day in modern life. So mining's a big part of our economic future uh, for years to come. But let's not pretend this is a fight between the Liberals and the National Party who want to defend these jobs and us who are prepared to give them up. That's not the case at all. You've got a Liberal and National Party who want people working in the mining industry on lower wages, uh, worse conditions, and, and just incidentally, if those big global mining companies could automate every job, you wouldn't have the LNP saying, no, sorry, we're not going to automate those jobs. They'd say, no, bring it on, uh, bring it on. So I, I just get very irritated by this false dichotomy that somehow you're either for or against mining jobs. Uh, and you can you can be in favour of renewable energy, but that means that you're going to turn your back on people in regional communities who rely on mining for their livelihoods. That's not the case. It doesn't have to be the case in this country. You think about um, areas like the Hunter and the fantastic work that Newcastle University is doing on saying, we've got everything we need in this community to be uh, manufacturing superpower. We've got fantastic... Um, potential for renewable energy, maybe hydrogen, they've got transmission lines, they've got the land, they've got um, the know-how from Newcastle University. The Hunter can be and should be an economic powerhouse. And I think this one-dimensional debate that we've entered into is way too simplistic. Speaking to trade union leaders in the minerals industry, you make a point there about someone employed by a company and someone employed indirectly by a company through a labour hire company and the latter getting less than the former. But it, as you know, wages in the mining industry are substanti substantially higher than they are in the re renewables industry. I mean, substantially. Probably double, possibly more than double. So one of the resentments there is that miners, whether they're enough 
they'd prefer to be run, working for a company than, than a labour hire company, I guess. Um, but even so, their wages are very high. These are some of the highest paid workers in the country. Mm. And they feel their jobs are threatened by people like the kind of um, message that Mark Butler gives. I mean, leaving aside the Greens, just talking yeah. within the Labour Party. I just don't think that's fair. There is literally no one in the Labour Party who doesn't want to see continued uh, good employment and conditions for people in the mining sector. Nobody thinks coal is finishing tomorrow or gas is finishing tomorrow, but we know long term that when you've got a cheaper source of energy, our economy will increasingly rely on that. The, the fact that people in renewable sectors are paid less, again, is a choice that we are making as an economy. We've got a government that is doing its very best to drive down wages across the board. You had Matthias Cormann say that low wages are a deliberate part of their economic strategy. That's not that long ago. Um, until we have strong industrial relations mechanisms that make sure that people are paid decently and their work is secure, there will be a rush to the bottom, particularly in an environment with high unemployment and underemployment. That's bad for all of us. But as you know, uh, Australian wages are probably the highest in the world, highest in the Western world. And they could be higher if there was productivity, but they're not low. I mean, the, the minimum hourly rate in Australia would be about twice what it is in the United States. And, and, and higher than in much of Europe. And, and who wants to live like that? In, in the United States, people working, if there is a, a legislated minimum in their state, which of course in many states there isn't, you have people who are working full time who are relying on food stamps. That's not good for that individual, but it's also not good for aggregate demand or confidence in the economy. Well, I, I agree with that, but Australian wages are about the, among the highest in the world. I'm not saying we should have lower wages. I'm just saying that our wages are very high compared, and we're trading on world markets. We've seen Australian wages flatlining for years. Well, that's true around the rest of the world. Yeah, well, we've Europe, seen North wages America. flatlining. Company profits have held up pretty well. Yeah. Uh, the link between, you mentioned the link with productivity. I, I think uh, most people are up for a conversation about linking productivity with wage growth because we've seen... Uh, the decoupling of productivity growth and wage growth in recent years, and I think that's a serious problem. One of the reasons is that um, enterprise bargaining has gone into a period where it's just it's just easier for some employers to allow drift, not to uh, not to work with their workforce to see productivity improvements that would be um, that would go hand in hand with wages increases. But if you're talking about wage increases. I mean, obviously, there's some companies who can pay more. There are a lot of medium to small businesses who struggle to pay what they pay now. So any across-the-board increase in wages, across the board, irrespective of whether a company's doing well or a small company's doing badly, is going to have impacts on both, but the most deleterious impact will be on the small company. Well, wages, wages increases are generally not across the board. I'm not talking about... Uh, well, they are, actually. The, the minimum rate is across the board wage. OK, yeah. but most businesses, most industries don't pay the minimum wage. Yeah, but a lot of people in small business do. Exactly. I mean, anyone on yeah. casual rates... And, and, and I think you have to be rate. sensitive to that. I, yeah. I do have to think you have to be sensitive to that. But if you take some industries, like early childhood education and care, like aged care, like disability services, you see some of the worst paid workers in our community, some of the most insecure work, increasingly casualised, uh, and you, ca you cannot tell me that it's not related to the fact that these are largely feminised workforces. You've got people working in aged care for just over $21 an hour, doing really serious, responsible, important, difficult work. How is it proper that you can earn more stacking shelves at a supermarket on the weekend than looking after older Australians? We are... Um, and when you take an industry like aged care, like disability, like early childhood education and care, uh, there are very substantial taxpayer subsidies in all of those areas. Um, I think it is... 
I think it's unfair to the workforce and dangerous for the rest of us if we continue to let wages in these industries uh, flatline in the way they have it, in the way they have in recent years. But some of those industries, or within, within those industries, some of them are government run. So why, so why why aren't governments paying more? Which would be <coughs> the current coalition government, the previous Labor governments, the various state governments. If, if more should be paid, then more should be paid, shouldn't it? I think that's a very good question. So, so I mean, who's, who's stopping it? Uh, well, I mean, it's just the market operating, isn't it? No, I, I, I don't think it's as simple as that. Well, when Labor was in office and, and there, were, there were certain of those areas under the, well, certainly under the control of Labor state governments, State government can always increase payments for people who work in, in government hospitals. And I, I can give you an example where we did that with the social and community sector award where we had people working in um, homelessness services, domestic violence, drug and alcohol. Uh, the, the workers in that industry took a case to um, the industrial relations courts and it was determined that their industry was uh, largely underpaid because it was largely feminised work and they had increases, in some cases very substantial increases of I think at the highest end over 40% but um, brought in over a number of years in acknowledgement that it's very hard for governments to fund such large increases overnight. And that's made a really important difference to the the day-to-day -day budgets of the, the people who work in that industry, but it also makes a difference to being able to attract and retain a workforce. Mm -hmm. If you look at somewhere like aged care, at early childhood education and care is another good example. We've been relying a lot in recent years on um, temporary skilled uh, migrants to fill those jobs because they're so badly paid that it was hard to find Australians to do the work. Uh, and because we have dropped the ball on training in areas like disability services, aged care, community services, early childhood education and care, um, we're not going to have large movement of people on temporary skilled visas anytime soon. So perhaps you're right, perhaps it will just be a market and the shortages will cause wages to go up. But uh, it's pretty alarming that we need to have shortages in areas like aged care during a pandemic for that to be the response. Well, that, as you know, is also the argument in the United States where some argue that because of immigration coming across the borders, it suppresses wages of working class people in the southern states and, and elsewhere. And you don't, I don't, there's, there's a chapter on multiculturalism in your book there's not a lot on immigration. Now, it's very hard to estimate, but the way it's going, you would expect, according to your analysis, and I agree with it, that um, a shortage of workers in aged care will lead, should lead, you would expect will lead to an increase in, in wages in aged care, which would be a good outcome. Well, it would be a good outcome, but we do need to have the trained workforce ready to do it as well. And that's a, a, another um, critical area we've seen very substantial cuts in apprentices and trainees in recent years so uh, there are about 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees today than when the Liberals came to office seven years ago and we do need to make sure that we are uh, training people in those traditional trades where we've got shortages, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, hairdressers, uh, pastry chefs, um, tree loppers, there's a bunch of jobs where we've had shortages for some time, um, but also in the areas where we have just simply been going overseas whenever there's a shortage. Uh, like in um, nursing, for one example, early childhood um, aged care, uh, we've been filling those vacancies with temporary skilled migrants. If that's not available to us, we can't just snatch people off the streets and have them working in a nursing home tomorrow. We need to have training attached. So broadly in this, as we move in, as we sort of probably in the midst of, I don't know when we come out of the pandemic, what's Labor's position on immigration? You, you propose to go back to the high levels, which, which was a bi bipartisan policy essentially because 
uh, the coalition's had high levels of immigration uh, in recent times. I think that's a it's a very difficult question to answer for some time to come, Jared. It will really depend on uh, it will depend on our economy. It will depend on uh, when we get a vaccine, how successful that vaccine is, how the pandemic is. Um, spreading or contained in other countries. It will depend on a lot of things. And I think, obviously, the immediate priority has to be getting Australians back from overseas. We, As far as I, the last figures I heard, we still had about 25,000 Australians stuck overseas. I think that's a, a phenomenal failure, I, I, should, I think, uh, from the federal government. Um, so Australians stuck overseas, and of course I would like to see a return to... Uh, people who bring really substantial economic benefit to Australia, like overseas students, uh, like um, skilled migrants who would be contributing to the economy. I don't know when that will be able to happen. So I think of you, um, in terms of your political career, very successful one. I probably think more about you as speaking about education than other matters. And I know there's in your uh, stunning performances on the Ellen Jones' show on Sky <laughs> News where you... You do the remarkable thing of holding your own with Mr Jones, which isn't all that easy. You, there you talk a bit about uh, education as well. So before we talk about your own chapter, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, because you arrive out here with... Your parents come from Slovenia, and what then would have been called Yugoslavia. That's right. It's a small country, a small part of Yugoslavia, now it's a small nation of its own. So tell us a bit about your own background and how that led to this interest in education, which you've always... Exhibited. My parents came to Australia in the early 50s. They met in Australia, actually, both from Slovenia, but they met in Australia. They met at a dance at the Paddington Town Hall, just up the road here. Yeah. <laughs> and they always, um, they weren't pushy parents, but anything, if I said anything was for, for school or for my education, that was it. That I, they didn't have a lot of money, but if I said we've got an excursion or I need some new pencils or uh, I'd like to buy that book, that was it, they would find the money for it. And I think they were a lot of, like a lot of um, post-war migrants, they, they'd had their own education interrupted by the war. They, they were kids in primary school, they went to school one day and the, their familiar teachers were gone and the new teachers were speaking German, like it was a pretty disrupted childhood. Um, they saw that education was just a ticket to freedom and choice in life. And so they supported my brothers and I. They said, while ever we were at school or at uni, um, they would you know, support us financially. They, were, um, they didn't have much formal education themselves, but they really valued it. And I think that attitude um, has given my... or gave my brothers and I a lot of freedom to pursue what we were interested in. Uh, I'm very grateful for that, but I would never have been able, and my brothers and I would never have been able to afford to go to university but for the Whitlam higher education reforms. So, Well, I'm not sure that's right, because you're bright. You, you've, I, 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 I know Ray, and you're bright. I mean, you would have won a Commonwealth scholarship under the old system. And most likely under the old system, I would have had a choice between nursing and teaching. And, and that's fine. They're both wonderful professions. Hang on. But there is you a difference. You could have gone to university. My sister went to university. Uh, and people won Commonwealth scholarships. And uh, they not only got free education, they also got a, a, a tax-free allowance. It was probably more generous than just the free education because you got a... And you, 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 you would probably top your class, didn't you? Well, I was ducks of my well, husband. Go. <laughs> that's a, that's well, a like long time ago. Ah, uh, it's not that long. And, 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 the, and that, yeah. it's not it's not just about the the small number of people who get the opportunity. Our mission is to democratize, democratize the access to university as well. So in a in a complex economy where nine out of ten jobs that are being created at the moment need a, a post secondary qualification, whether university or TAFE, having a highly rationed uh, entry into university is counterproductive for the whole economy. Life's more complex. Jobs are more complex. Work is more complex today than it was uh, decades ago. And our education system should reflect that. So before I get back on to education, because I've got an interest in history, did you individually, did your parents flee Yugoslavia or were they allowed out? It wasn't as repressive as 
most no. of the regimes in Eastern Europe. They fled. They, they, fled. they yeah. escaped at night. It, um, my father left and crossed the border to Austria. Um, he was sh uh, shot at as he was crossing the border. I think he had to swim across a river. He luckily had an, an auntie that lived in Austria that he was able to stay with for a while and finish his, um, his apprenticeship in Austria. My mother escaped uh, on, on the, um, t across the border to Italy and she um, was first in a refugee camp in Italy and uh, lived with a family there for a time as a domestic help. And both of them were um, offered uh, passage to Australia by the International or uh, Organisation for Migration. It could have been Australia, it could have been anywhere. They were just happy to have somewhere safe. They're well, pretty, pretty resourceful people, but it's good to know they were welcomed by Sir Robert Menzies' Liberal government here. Yeah, and, and they felt grateful. They, my mother's still alive, feel grateful every day of their lives for that. And I think that um, that sense of gratitude and having to repay the great gift of Australian citizenship has really informed the way they raised my brothers and I. I'll come to education in a second. Before you, I go into that, you, you quote here in your chapter, you, uh, you quote the, uh, what's it called, the uh, declaration that people so sign up the, to. The Australian the citizen Citizenship Pledge. Which I think came in with the Labor government, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yes, and th this is one of the things that I, when I... I've said this a few times, that it would be good um, if more people knew it and said it, particularly on Australian Day, uh, on Australia Day. And I had uh, this kind of massive pile on of left wingers saying it's terrible how um, you know how right wing it was for me to say that uh, that people should know our pledge. But this replaced it. it rep this is the pledge we make to one another. Uh, that, that we share democratic values, whose rights and liberties I respect, whose laws I will uphold and obey. This is the most simple, elegant way of saying what is required from us as citizens. You don't have to be white. You don't have to pledge your loyalty to the Queen. You don't have to pledge your loyalty to a p political party or a particular government. We pledge our loyalty as Australian citizens to one another. And if there's anything that COVID has taught us, it's that sense of responsibility to one another is what enlivens us as a society and holds us together, uh, even economically holds us together. I think, it's a, um, I think it's a very neat way of expressing what, it, what is required of us as citizens. Yeah. And it's not, a hard, it's not a hard burden for the privileges that it brings. It works out well in your chapter, and it's good to know the left oppose it. Um, <laughs> I think it was... Uh, I'm not sure it was the Hawke or the Keating government. I know Les Murray had, the poet Les Murray, who died yes. recently, had something to do with this. The only bit that he wrote that I ever understood, I'd have to say, yeah. but it does come up very well. So I'll just, I want to move back a bit to, to the post-Cobbett thing in a minute, but tell me, um, you're not likely to become education minister, I would guess, um, but if you were, you might have something more senior than that, but if you were... And you're only, you would only be a, the Commonwealth Minister, you're not the State Minister or Territory Minister who actually run the things. Mm -hmm. What would your priorities be? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not, uh, I'm not keen to change portfolios. I chose the education okay. portfolio as the Deputy Leader because I think it's one of the greatest opportunities we have to make a difference to the lives of individuals yeah. and to the economic success of our nation. So if I could change tomorrow, I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, I did the Foreign Affairs portfolio in the first term yes. as Deputy Leader yeah. in Education in the second term. I had my choice of portfolios. Uh, I, um, what, what would I change? What would I do? I think uh, one of the most undervalued areas of investment and reform is early childhood education because the return is so great. If kids start school educationally disadvantaged, if they haven't caught up by age eight, then you will see that disadvantage live with them for the rest of their lives. So those early years are when we can make the biggest difference. Uh, so early childhood education and up to about year three in primary school, I think need a, a much 
sharper focus. Uh, and then schooling. Now, of course I support um, greater funding in our schools, but it's what we do with the dollars that matters. I think having the best and brightest attracted to teaching as a career is critical. It, it is heartbreaking for me that we continue to see marks to get into teaching degrees slide because it, not only does it potentially attract people who are not suitable to become teachers into the profession, but it sends such a bad signal of the value that we place as a society on education. I want kids who are the topping their school to be, to be competing to get into teaching degrees and then I want to make sure that we take those super smart teachers and keep them in the classroom. So teaching, uh, when you first come out of university, it's pretty good pay when you start a teaching degree. By the time you're a highly experienced teacher who's done eight or ten years in the classroom, really to see an increase much beyond that, you need to become a principal, you need to go into school administration, you need to come into Department of Education head office, you need to go off and do a completely different career. What a waste of talent that is. If we could continue to see those highly skilled teachers, not just teaching in the classroom, but teaching other teachers to become highly successful as well, that would be a really important reform. And the Commonwealth can set um, standards around that. We can set standards and support the use of research in our classrooms, actually being scientific about what helps kids learn most effectively. Here in New South Wales we did a program called Reading Recovery for years before we worked out we were wasting our money. The kids who did the program actually didn't have much better results you know, two years later than the kids who'd never done the program. How tragic is that? That we would spend tens of millions of dollars on something that was letting kids down. We should be as scientific in our approach to education as we are in our approach to a new medicine or a new medical procedure, and we're not. So we're getting towards the end now. I think the book is very nicely produced by New South, um, but I've come across, I think, an error in, in the introduction that you wrote, and I just think it's a technical error. Is that because I haven't dedicated it to you, Jerry? Well, partly that. <laughs> and this quote from the author, Erinati Roy. Now, I think this is probably mistaken. You picked this up from the kind of the Green Left Weekly in your electorate, handed out by the Greens, oh, and you oh, stuck yes, it in your book, because it seems terribly alienated. She's saying what we are doing at the moment, we're walking through, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, our dead ideas, our dead rivers, and the smoking sky behind us. That sounds like an alienated rat from a 1960s lefty, doesn't it? I, I love this quote. Do you? Because she's saying we can choose. We can choose to hang on to the things that weren't working. But is that it now? I, mean, I don't know what life well, we can... the electorate of Sydney, but it's not as grim as that where I come from. It, it's actually an excellent piece, and I, really, I commend to you the, the rest yeah, of the piece. I, see. Uh, I, I think the point that Aaron Daddy Roy is making here is so important. We can choose to hang on to the things that weren't working, or we can let go of the things that weren't working and grab onto the things that will give us a stronger economy and a fairer society after COVID-19. You're not going to be our Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez <laughs> woman I, in the next government, I, I, I do not. I do not have this, the uh, social media skills that she does. No. I, ca I, cannot, I cannot fix an IKEA bookshelf or put on my makeup while talking politics on the social media. <laughs> So she won't be in the next edition if there is one. She won't. But, but, but Anadi Roy will stay in and I'm with not the dead ruling, rivers and. The, I'm not ruling it out. Not ruling it out. <laughs> um, so finally, I think uh, we're pretty close to the end. So just get, tell us again. You, you've got. Tell me. Tell me what Clay Blanchett and Kim Williams are on about because oh, it's she's a, got a huge following here. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. I spoke to her on the phone once. You know, yeah, no, she's still she's wonderful. Fame, yeah. Um, Kate Blanchett and Kim Williams have written together about arts policy in Australia and Kate has got a beautiful, uh, a beautiful part of the chapter where she talks about how this need to communicate for artists and for the broader community has been shown to be 
uh, a need, not just a want during COVID-19, that people profoundly felt the lack of being able to go out and socialise and enjoy a concert or music or go to the pub and hear a band uh, and that artists themselves have found ways to break through and communicate. So her piece of the chapter is very good. Kim brings his razor sharp intellect to that proposition and says we need a better arts policy in Australia and we really do. I mean this is one of the areas where the government has said they'll spend $250 million. At last count, they'd spent none of that money supporting an industry with uh, tens of thousands of people who have seen their, um, their, their income very significantly impacted by COVID-19. So you've both got, uh, you've got a, a very artistic and a very intellectual lens on this very important subject. Well, I think it's good reason if we're all locked up again. <laughs> This book could sell very well in Victoria. <laughs> well, possibly South Australia. Oh, and South yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, it's about very that. worrying, very worrying indeed. So, uh, anyway, look, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Hope it goes well. Thank and you. And well done today. Thank, Thank you. you.